different investment offer, options with respect to the shareholders and the different classes of stocks. And so you'll typically see if you're planning on going through a more institutional investment route, a corporation is typically going to be your best choice. Uh, and then with respect to Texas and Delaware, again, from a legal standpoint, there is really no difference at this time. Back to the is make sure you have enough shares when you're going to start, if you're going to be selling off equity to, to, to future investors, make sure you have enough shares from the beginning. A common issue we see, and these are kind of just, you know, tips and tricks of things that we run into. A common thing we'll see is that somebody will form a company, they'll issue 100 shares. That seems like a lot of shares. And they'll issue them all to themselves because they're the sole owner at the beginning. That sounds good, at least from that standpoint. Then they're bringing in someone who wants to invest 10% in that company. That person, however, is not buying a 10% interest in the company. They're now buying that 10% interest from the shareholder. And that creates a couple different complications with respect to who actually is liable on that contract. And then also that is a taxable event from the current shareholder to the prospective purchaser. And so what we recommend is when you're starting a new entity, particularly a corporation, it really doesn't matter how many shares. We say Start a million shares. Start with a million shares of capitalization. Take whatever percentage you need. And now when you have investors coming forward, you can distribute those shares out of the currently undistributed pot. So that's just kind of something that we run into. It ends up, it's not a big deal, but it's a, it's a complication and it's a road, you know, it's a speed bump that people will run into. And then the other thing on there, uh, and I know Pete is very keen on this, is make sure your cap tables are accurate. Your cap table is showing who has ownership in this company. A lot of times the cap table will say, I'm the sole owner. And you may be at that moment, but you're generally, there is somebody out there that has some sort of a prospective uh, interest in your company. And that needs to be reflected, reflected in the cap table, whether it's through a safe agreement, which are kind of these agreements where you have these future uh, equity investments or some sort of a, a contingent promissory note. Those will oftentimes be floating out there. And if they're not uh, accounted for in your capitalization table, you may all of a sudden now be selling 110 or 120 percent of your company to prospective investors. You can end up in a very uh, unfortunate situation where you didn't get to deal with me as a litigator, which is an expensive proposition. You don't want to do that. So the, really the, the main takeaway here is no matter what entity you form, make sure your capitalization, your cap table reflects who owns the company both now and prospectively in the future. So something just to keep an eye on. Um, you know, one of the things we get asked are what investors want to see. Now, we've got experts here that can actually answer this question with more detail than I can. But what what we've seen, again, from the legal side, just kind of from the advice side, is you got to have a business plan, which sounds fairly straightforward. Um, but the business plans oftentimes that we, we review is this is what my plan is. And it just stops right there. This is my plan. And one of the big things that we see have, have, have asked is, well, what who are the competitors? What are they doing? Why are they in the market? Why are they better than you? Why are you better than them? So address, make sure your business plan addresses that. Make sure you've got your financials, your performance ready to go. Don't get asked, you know, what's your, your financial situation? And you go, I have no idea. You know, be prepared to answer those questions. Um, and then another one that we run into where we have prospective investors who, when they're performing their due diligence, um, that really dig into this is the source and use of funds. Investors want to know who has given you the money so far and where has that money gone? So be able to answer those questions, be able to explain, this is my, these are my funding sources and this is where it's been distributed. This is what's been spent on, on uh, you know, capital. This is what's been spent on equipment. This is what's been spent on, on salaries and whatnot. Um, so just be prepared to, uh, to have that information. And it's important. It's how you're going to continue to develop your business and go on. Um, last slide. Um, I have to, because I'm an IP lawyer, I had to throw a slide in here about intellectual property, even though it's not quite what this is, but it's important for early stage companies to identify some certain traps. A lot of IP can be addressed later on, trademarks, things like that. Don't worry about it now. But certain issues you need to be aware of right now. Patents are obviously going to be the most common type of intellectual property that this room and, and, and we're going to be talking about because it's an asset. Oftentimes it's the only asset that the company has. And so recognize where you're going to have patentable intellectual property and recognize where it is worth getting that patent because it can really drive up the value and increase investment. But also be aware that there are th there's what's known as bar dates. And most of y'all are probably aware of this. But if you do certain things publicly with your intellectual, with your invention, with your intellectual property, whether it's talking about it, selling it, offering to sell it, things like that, you run into the risk of not being able to get a patent later on. There, there are timing aspects that everyone needs to be aware of. So if you've got ideas and you've got intellectual property, make sure you're talking to an IP attorney. It's really kind of my takeaway of of that you're not going to accidentally bar yourself from being able to protect your, your most important prop, intellectual property. 
And the last thing I have on here, just to mention, are, are trade secrets, which is kind of a, a, a different type of IP. Sometimes it's, it's considered kind of the opposite of patents, because while it's patents are everything's out in the open, trade secrets, everything, of course, is, uh, is, is restricted. And certain types of, of, of IP, certain types of, uh, of, of inventions that you have, trade secrets may be a better option. Now, one of the aspects that we have to deal with is that can be difficult to disclose and share with prospective investors, obviously, because the reason it's valuable is no one else knows about it. But we've got, you know, there are NDAs and other contractual agreements that you can take to ensure that your intellectual property is protected, whether it's through a patent or a trade secret or something like that. So I think that is all I had. Yes, it is. So thank you all for listening to me twice on parts of it. And we'll, uh, we'll be back for questions. So, so thanks, Mike. Thanks for, for being uh, accommodating. So before we continue, I saw a thumbs up from the back of the room. We think we're good to go? All right. I'll believe that for some time. Anyway, so um, take away there. Attorneys are an important part of this. Uh, they're there to protect us and to, to, to do things the right way. So next we have an entrepreneur, Jose Quintana, entrepreneur extraordinaire, mentors entrepreneurs, has a incubator of sorts and uh, we'll share some of his thoughts about uh, from, the, from the, the, the actual founder's perspective. Thank you, Peter. Howdy. 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 You know, I was in uh, Portugal giving a little lecture and I forgot that they don't use howdy there. <laughs> and it was a little interesting. One person, there was an Aggie in the room that <laughs> Tell me, howdy. Um, that's all I need, just one, one good person to support the cause. Um, well, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, I, I think I'm the oldest of the, the lecturers today, so uh, bear with me. And um, also, I'm from a different country. I was born in Mexico, so my, my, my English is not very good, but I will do my best to, uh, to pronounce it properly. Um, I came to A&M uh, to study computer science, math, and statistics, and um, I was so happy being here, um, getting, getting my engineering degree. I remember I just, uh, just to give you some background, I applied only for one job with IBM, and I got the job. And then uh, six months later, they called me and said, Jose, uh, you don't have a permanent residency, so we cannot really uh, uh, hire you. You only have a two-year um, uh, temporary work visa, so on. No. Oh, you. Thank you. And um, anyway, um, so at that point, I had to make a decision. I had to either uh, go back to my country at the, at the time or stay here and um, start my own business. And I made the terrible mistake of starting my own business right out of school without any business or legal experience. So it was pretty rough, but man, I owe a lot to our university. All our faculty members, they helped me. They became our first customers. It was great. And about three years after that, I um, uh, applied for an SVIR, actually two of them, because I wanted to make sure I increased my probability of getting the, the grant. And lo and behold, I got both SVIRs, and I think, you know, it's so easy, man. Everybody should apply for an SVIR. Well, nowadays it's not that easy, but um, that, that were my, my, those were my humble beginnings. And then um, in 2001, I retired, and in 2004, I opened, officially opened a technology and business incubator uh, in downtown Bryan. Actually, it was open in, at the research park. We were there for about five years, and then we moved the incubator to downtown Bryan. So my perspective is, is all from experience on uh, working with uh, different technology uh, developers, if you will, inventors, some like you and, and, and others. So I just wanted to give you some, some uh, statistics based on, on our experience. Um, actually, at our incubator, we about 20% of the companies belong to local startups. So um, I would say most of them come from outside. 35% uh, are actually international startups that come from places like Belgium and, and the UK mostly. Now, as of late, we have some startups from Brazil and other places, but uh, Europe still our, our best, um, kind of our most popular uh, incubated company. And they, they use us to get into the U.S. market. So they really look at how can we bring 
marketing and, and commercialization strategies um, into a, a position where these international companies can take advantage of. And uh, just to share more information with you, 20% um, of the startups that come to our incubator already, I mean, do need funding. So most of them already have funding. Um, of those 20%, uh, the average raise is about $450,000. And, um, and I also wanted to share with you, because some, I know some of you are faculty uh, members of our university. Um, originally, I thought that faculty members, the number one need was going to be funding, but it's not, because a lot of them already come with um, grants, SBIRs, personal funding. So really, the number one need that they have, at least the, 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 the faculty members that come to see us, going to be marketing, communications, sales, and strategy formation. Um, some of them require support from the product development side, simply because, as you know, it takes a long time to manage development teams. So we are able to, to provide that level of support as well. So moving along, um, when it comes to strategic considerations uh, for, the, for, for starting your own company, Within our case, we have developed a method called uh, DREAL, and actually it wasn't us, it was one of our faculty um, investors. Uh, he partnered with us and developed something called the value creation model. So I'm mentioning that because that's the, the method that we use to understand the difference between having an amazing, good-looking baby versus having a baby that can create value for a customer, for a, for a, for a market, right? So there's a big difference between how neat the technology is and how much money is going to generate. So we use that particular process. It's very simple. And um, if, you, if you look into it, it's online, it's, it's free. You will be able to use it not only to determine whether or not you're going to start your company, but also once you start, how to identify those developmental opportunities that you need to focus on to be successful. Um, one of the, the items I wanted to, to mention, um, in our case, the, the pre-formation strategy is very important. I think that fits into the legal aspect of how to form a company. So um, we, we already heard the uh, description of the different uh, options we have, you know, LLCs, uh, C-Corps, S-Corps. With us, the most popular, um, the most popular uh, legal vehicle that we, that we use is uh, C-Corporations, simply because we do have a lot of international, uh, not only international uh, entrepreneurs, but also international investors. So you need to be very careful with that. Um, and before you start, uh, one of the advice we give to, to our entrepreneurs is do not start your company until you absolutely need to start the company. So wait as long as you can, because the players in your team, players in your ecosystem are going to change. And I don't know how many times I've seen this, but um, we get a, a group of three or four students. They are all equal partners. They come to us and say, hey, we're forming this company. Well, when I'm meeting with them, I know that six months from now, two of them are going to be gone because they're going to get an amazing job at Google making $200,000 a year or because they're going to get married and they have to be, go to a different, different place. So the, 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 if you wait until you, are, um, until you need to form your company, you're able to create a very simple, what we call a pre-formation agreement. It's, it's a one to two page document. And I'm sure you can, you also help um, customers with, with this, where you simply state um, who is doing what and, and what is that gonna earn for them in the form of equity? What are their obligations? And that way, if somebody leaves, you don't have to worry about reassigning equity. You don't have to, to incur those legal expenses and those uncomfortable situations uh, that, that you sometimes have to deal with when you have to ask for your stock back because somebody's walking away. Um, when it comes to um, building a team of employees and advisors, uh, what we recommend, what we practice, is the assessment of the, the founders within the context of their business proposition, their value proposition. So um, the, the, the easy method to use is if you do some sort of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, within the context of the profile of each one of your founders. So let's say you have three founders. One of them is great at, at finance. The other one is great at sales. And the other one is great at technology development. Well, now you know you have a certain, um, certain um, set of capabilities that you don't have to seek outside of, of those initial founders. One of the, the, um, the great tools that we have in, in our world is the development of advisory councils. 
So bring in your advisors, offer them some sort of value. A lot of advisors um, you know, are willing to participate because they believe on your vision and they believe in you, right? But um, it's also important to establish a way to compensate those advisors. So there are different methods you can use to do that. We're happy to, to dive into that on the Q&A or separately. But one of the things we try to do is have a set of advisors that is broad enough. So don't just start bringing advisors into your company first. Go through the analysis of where are the voids, where are the gaps that you need to be able to, uh, to fulfill. And we split, uh, generally we split, we create a matrix and we split the advisors into two different groups, direct and indirect stakeholders. And the way we catalog the direct and indirect um, uh, designation is based on how close is the advisor to the user community. So for instance, if you are developing a, um, a fighter jet, direct users will be represented by the pilot uh, maybe the navigation officer, weapons officer, and mechanic, right? Those are direct users. They represent the, the customer base that is closer to your product, your idea, your invention. Indirect users are going to be those that um, have a lot of influence but are not involved in a day-to-day -day use of your product. So those will be people like the general that signs the PO to buy the, your aircraft or the congressman that assigns, uh, designates the money or allocates a budget to buy your airplane. So that's how we, we catalog them. And then we go through a full uh, process to be able to, this, to, to elaborate and establish their compensation model per group. And I will mention later why it's important to divide those into two different uh, profiles. When it comes to team formation um, and comes to, to hire employees, you know, we advise our, our uh, entrepreneurs to try to not hire employees at the beginning of, of the company, if it's possible. Uh, time is your, small, your most valuable um, asset when you're an entrepreneur. And if you start spending time from, you know, shifting from the innovation efforts to managing people or, you know, having to put in place HR guidelines and having to deal with payroll and and tax filings and so on, that, that really takes a lot of energy, a lot of time from, from the uh, founding team. So if, if possible, try to see where you can outsource um, some of these functions. When it comes to technology and product development, usually the, the founding team, they bring somebody that, that can handle the core aspect of the development of the technology. But in many cases, you need more than just one person. Also, in many cases, you should have more than one person from an investor perspective, if the technology that has been developed to, to get ready for commercialization depends on just one individual, that is a huge red flag, right? Because what happens if, God forbid, you know, the, 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 the CTO uh, gets sick or, um, or gets divorced and has to leave the, the country for some reason, or, um, or worse, you know, dies? You, you have a huge setback, and, and that has, I've witnessed that many times. It's a very, very... Uh, um, risky situation. So evaluate those things. We usually what we do, do is we try to have a hybrid uh, model where product development gets assigned to a team that is already used to working on rapid application development. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you want to save money, right? So if you think about it, you're going to hire a developer. The developer, let's say, is going to make in Texas only, you know, $90,000 a year. Well, you add your overhead and all that, and fully, fully burdened salaries can go above easily above hundred thousand dollars so so consider those those um, those costs but also consider the fact that sometimes you are not going to have that person in production mode right you're going to be idle so when you have a team that is already used to working with with uh, startups um, on the technology development side they can pause and that will not continue to burn money for you you can actually pause your your money um, ex expenditures um, at any given time. So be aware of those those uh, flexibilities. Also, the fact that if you if you're not, are not able to generate generate enough revenue to pay your employees, you're not going to have to worry about firing somebody, right? You're working with an outsource model. You're going to be able to to uh, shift um, energy and and uh, re, re, renegotiate your contract with your vendors. So that that will also include marketing and communications, business development, and back office services. 
Um, a very important point, some of the advisors that may join your team will be able to provide you with a lot of help in those different fields. And if you don't have the expertise for that, if you don't like to be selling a product out there in the in the market, um, find a good a good advisor that has that talent and is able to open open doors and then reward them in a way that they can you know make some money based on commissions those type of things. Um, so once you get into the go to market strategy, you know in in our case obviously from the very beginning you start with a discovery process where we go into research analysis and the visioning of of your idea and how that's going to be received by the market, be able to, to harvest uh, consumer sentiment and be able to, to document that in ways that allows you to make the right decisions. So from that, we go straight into uh, assigning priorities. And um, at the end of the day, what we want to do is mapping those priorities into the realization or the development of an MVP, a minimally viable product that you can start. We want to get from zero to having a tangible product as soon as possible so that you can start generating, not only generating revenue, but more importantly, also getting feedback from your customer base, right? So, so, so that's a critical aspect of, of, the, of the method that you should consider. Um, once you are into the implementation, once you have identified what are those critical, uh, those best developmental opportunities, um, you know, look at the development of those functional sets, you know, what attributes and what functions are going to be part of your, your invention or your, your final product. Uh, based on things like dependencies, you know, is, is, is a feature going to be in conflict with another feature? If you are developing an airplane, an, uh, a fighter jet, for instance, you know that um, if you want a long range, that means the, 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 the fighter jet needs to, be, needs to have a certain degree of fuel efficiency. Well, if you want speed, you know, there's a, there's, a, 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 there's a conflict between those two feature sets. So just be aware of those things. And um, there's a very simple method called QFV, quality function deployment, was developed last century. It will allow you to, to go through that process. Just invest the time to go through that kind of matrix-based functional requirements versus um, risks and, and features uh, set. Um, and uh, once you have uh, the opportunity, I, I, we always recommend, you know, consider launching a pilot program, consider uh, launching a, a functional prototype where you have actual customers interacting with you. Uh, and, you know, sometimes those early adopters, those early customers will become your, your partners. They many times are able to provide you with additional capital. They will buy into your vision, especially if you're addressing one of their, their, their pain points. Um, and to do that, we, we usually have a set of, you know, recommendations based on preferred terms that your customer can receive. Um, plan for investment and use of funds. Um, you know, I wanted to to share with you a detail. I'm a big, I'm big, big against um, business plans. I, I, you know, we we gone through that process many, many times. And so nowadays, um, if you are on a high tech business uh, opportunity, if you if that's your your goal. The money that you will invest in a business plan will be better invested or better spent if you if you invested on on a, on the on building a pilot or a prototype, and you still need to have you know your performa your your kind of overall business summary and things of that nature. Uh, an amazing uh, presentation deck goes a long way, uh, an, an investor's deck, but. Um, we we really advocate for for because of the technology changes so fast nowadays. If you write a business plan and you invest, let's say, $80,000 on investing on, on developing the business plan, by the time you are talking to investors, by the time you're talking to your customers, a, a lot of time lapse and, and some of the components of your, your technology framework would have changed. Market changes, interest rates change. I mean, a lot of things change. So focus on, on getting the money first, kind of uh, counterintuitive, but you need to you know, be flexible. Uh, have something that you can show to your investors. Um, so I wanted to preface that uh, before jumping into the funding scenarios. But um, once once you're ready, once you have your money, obviously always assess where you are in the development of your company, because different requirements apply to different stages of your development uh, stage. So if you're in seed capital mode, you know you ha you're going to have very big difference, uh, different set of needs than if you are in a growth stage of your company. So be aware of those things, map it properly. Again, reach out to your advisors to make sure that, that you are not making assumptions that are that are, are going to be um, 
risky or dangerous when it comes to the presenting them to your investors. Um, outline and prioritize uh, capital need for critical areas. Uh, in our case, obviously, usually product development is the number one. Marketing and, and um, customer acquisition, being able to focus on those early adopters, get some, some traction there. Um, once you have enough capital, enough, enough volume of sales and capital, uh, sales team expansion, usually hiring salespeople is very expensive. It is, it is quite expensive and it's hard to, to manage because opportunities come from all over the place and a good salesperson is going to pursue those and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to manage expenses, travel and so on. So what we, we try to do is if there is a group that you can work with that can take that risk away from you, you know, it's worth assigning a good percentage to a sales support team. Um, versus having to have that internal cost. And, and especially if you have somebody in your founder's team that is good at sales and is good at understanding the market. Um, operational expenses also are, are very important. And then obviously legal and compliance are going to be very important, especially because you need to protect your IP and you need to be able to have a very, just a solid uh, initial um, investment instrument in order to avoid any headaches down the line. Um, also, always establish a contingency fund. Um, things happen. Um, you know, the, the, one of the most important things that, that I come across with, with successful entrepreneurs is um, the, the importance of timing. And timing is, is such, such a valuable um, asset to have on your side. So in order to take advantage of that, you sometimes need to have that flex funding that allows you to, to um, get into specific opportunities um, without having to, to raise money. So always put aside something for, for those type of opportunities and for things that may come that are not planned. Um, one of the things uh, you always hear is uh, cash is king. Well, to me, uh, I would say that positive cash flow is even a better king. So with that, thank you very much. So thank you, Jose. Amazing amount of things to consider. You know, there's forming a company and then there's really forming a company. So so thank you for that. Uh, finally, we're here from the investor perspective, Mike Bridges. Um, I don't want to steal his thunder, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, I think of, I've, I've met lots of entrepreneurs who think about being a, starting my company is, means I get to work in Starbucks and shorts and flip-flops. And that's not that because these are the guys that you have to work for. So thank you. Um, Jose, there were some real nuggets and there's some real good stuff in that. So uh, pretty cool. Hey, so anyway, when Chris and Pete asked me to come talk to you all today, one of the first things I did is I went to Google and I typed in, what are the rules about a non-Aggie starting a conversation with Howdy. And uh, it was kind of interesting findings. Uh, Y'all are pretty inclusive, so I feel real comfortable starting off Howdy. Howdy. That's the first time I've ever done that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Um, so quickly about me, informal bio. Um, I'm a a relatively active early stage investor. I'm a limited partner in a number of different firms, but I'm getting ready to turn general partner at a at a Houston-based company called Cedar Round Capital. A little bit about me. I tell people I've got two technology failures under my belt. I have no engineering or coding skills, and I joke that I have no credible references, and most of those are true. Um, I, I'm a professional dreamer by trade. I love to think about your businesses. It's one of my favorite things to do on earth. But anyway, despite those shortcomings, somehow I made it here to talk to you today and give you the investor perspective on, on your startup. Quickly about Seed Around Capital. Um, we're uh, Houston-based. We, we write checks anywhere from fifty dollars to $150,000 on, on fast-growing companies. As Cedar Round Capital, we've we've made 42 investments collectively as individuals, over 250 companies. Um, we've all started companies, we've all operated companies, we've all sold companies, and I joke. Well, actually, I don't joke. We we've got the scars to prove it. So, um, I I want also wanted to kind of go back to my informal bio. It was 
it was self-deprecating for a purpose, is that you're going to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. What's important is that you learn from those mistakes, that you iterate quickly, and I like to say, make better mistakes tomorrow. If you had an algorithm that could go out into the world and adjust every single investment framework out there, it's all going to boil down to five points. No joke. Every single investment process is going to distill down to five points. So I'm going to give you an incredibly vague distillation of every single investment, every professional investor's investment process. And the first is team. And I'm really happy there's a lot of overlap on a lot of these points so that so it hits home. Team is the most, you are the most important aspect. That you're the most important variable that we're looking at. We want to know who you are before we make an investment decision. Traction, talked about that also. Does a customer with money want to give you that money to solve their problem? And I like to give bonus points. Can you solve multiple problems for that customer? Technology, why does your solution, your product solve my problem 10 times better than any solution available to me? Um, can I optimize you out of my equation? Everyone talks about total addressable markets. I like to focus on the actual obtainable market. How big is the direct problem that you are solving? I want to know that. I want to I want it measured in dollars. That helps me size. It helps me make decisions. And finally, uh, terms of the deal. It's in, it's simply the financial legal construct of our agreement to invest in you. Michael did a much better job talking about that than I would. So um, I, I also like to add a sixth T, and and the reason is. I am passionate about supporting, growing the, the startup ecosystem and cultures here in Texas. Um, but I, I don't want to minimize any of the above T's. They all deserve their own master class. They're all important. So when I say team at this early stage, what, what I'm really talking about is you, the founder, the founding team that you've assembled. Um, at Seed Round Capital as an individual, I've had a lot of at-bats at this. I have talked to a lot of founders, and I can generally bucket founders into four different groups. I wish I had more time so I could go into each of those groups in more detail, but I'm only going to talk about the, the top 1% to 2% of the people we talk to, the people that fit all of our requirements. And so rather than going through and reading each of those for you, I'll let you do that, or it'll be on a spreadsheet or a presentation will be sent to you, but I do want to talk about values. Um, that is super, super important to us. We want to know who you are. Are you honest? Do you have integrity? Are you accountable? Are you adaptable? You know, I want to know everything about you. Are you an authentic person? Um, and, 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 we're at, and how we're determining that is by asking ourselves and you various questions. But one of the first ones and one of the most important ones to me is, does this person want to start this business for the right reasons? Starting a business is not, it's absolutely not a get rich quick plan, okay? It's just not. So as important it is for us to understand you, um, we have to like you. And I, I'm going to stop there and I'm just going to sh put a mirror on that. What's even more important is that you like your investors, you like your advisors. You're going to spend the next six to 10 years with them. I mean, it's tantamount to getting married. So you better like them, you better trust them, you better respect them, et cetera. So, there. Found this in, in getting ready for this. I found this picture and I thought it was funny. And I think it's funny because it's true. Um, there's this huge, huge gap between what your friends, family, spouses, et cetera, think it looks like to start and run a business versus the right side, which is reality. Um, uh, I'll interject a personal a little personal story. On Sunday nights, I would lay in bed and think, what is going to happen this week? What kind of messed up thing is going to happen? And I will tell you, um, it never disappointed. It was an employee something or other. It was a customer something or other. They never disappointed. There was always something new, and I never predicted it, not once. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about sort of your the this career path that you're considering taking. I'm going to talk a little bit about your new boss, the investor, 
and, and probably touch on some more of the hats that you're going to wear. Needless to say, your life is going to change. I, I, I think that's understood. Um, we already talked about the modest expectations that your that your new boss is going to have of you, that your new boss, the investor. And I want to give you a pro tip on this. Your new boss, they want you to prosecute the opportunity at hand. They do not want their money sitting idle. They want you pushing forward. They want you executing at a high level. They want you hitting milestones, hitting the plan as you've presented it. They want momentum and they want their money back. So my, my tip to you, don't take money if you're not gonna really, really go after this. You're gonna spend a lot of time doing this. The idea here is that that burning desire that's sitting inside of you to take your product, take your solution to market, all the problems you're gonna solve, that's gonna fuel you through the long hours, holidays, weekends, life in general. Um, there's going to be constant pressure it, that will require constant hustle to for you to make decisions to solve problems on the fly. Um, quick little side story. I was talking to this founder, a portfolio company of ours. I was talking to the founder on the way up to College Station today. Um, and I told him that I was going to talk about him today. And, and he was like, oh, no, what? And I said, he asked me several months ago, when does a pressure stop? And I had a cold answer for him. Nine years. It's going to stop. The pressure's going to let off in nine years. It took me nine years for I could go on a vacation with my wife and family and not have this fear of existential, this is it. It's over with. Um, so, so sort of a brace for that. Um, you're, you're stepping out of a researcher or senior faculty role here, and you're jumping on a roller coaster. You're you're going to feel the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And the funny thing is, probably it will happen on the same exact day. Um, so that, that to me is, uh, that's a reality. And I will tell you that as an investor, probably close to 50% of my time spent with founders post-investment is helping founders navigate through this time and the anxiety and the anxiety that, that goes along with it. Um, you have a finite amount of money and a finite amount of time. And so you have to be an expert at balancing, prioritizing your priorities. What is the most important thing I can do today so I can hit my milestone tomorrow? The, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on building and leading a team, and, and you've heard each of us talk about this. Um, I used to have this joke. If it weren't for my employees and my customers, I would love my job. Um, it, it's fully not true. I, I miss those people desperately. I love those employees. But in the heat of the moment, at the time, it's a nightmare. Customers, I am deeply appreciative of my customers. They they gave me, my my family, our team, their families so much. So um, they're super important. But I want to talk about culture. Um, I cannot stress to you the importance of culture in your team. And as a early on in my early age investing career, I sort of virtue signal the importance of that. And I'm not afraid to, to admit when I make mistakes, I was dead wrong. Culture is so important. If, if you identify a cancer in your culture, and in, in retrospect, when I look back at my business, anytime we had a crisis, it was always a crisis of culture. So I'm gonna give you this. And I think you should write this one down. If you identify that you have cancer in your culture, kill it. And I mean, that day, and I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's your co-founder. I don't care if it's your first employee, and I don't care if it's your brother-in-law. Cancer only spreads. Get rid of it. Um, and, and I'm going to wrap up the slide with marketing and customer acquisition. I'm going to pick on the engineers. I cannot tell you how many engineers we talk to with seemingly disruptive tech, coolest thing I've ever seen, 
and they cannot get to a value prop. If you can't get to a value proposition, you're not getting in front of a customer and you're not helping them solve their problem. Um, and so I say that, and I'm gonna tell you something probably a little bit unusual. Even though you mostly are, most likely are an engineer, you're your company's best salespeople. Customers love founder journey. Customers love founder stories. Customers love the founder of the company, the CEO of the company showing up to help me solve my problem. And then in the next breath, I'm gonna tell you, as soon as you have found some, some uh, as soon as you have clear perspective and a view on product market fit, you have to go hire a professional salesperson. And there is a big difference between a salesperson and a professional salesperson. You need to enlist your advisors, your investors, anyone with some level of expertise in identifying and hiring this person. It's a super important hire. And that person needs to be able to run a process relentlessly, systematic and relentless. Uh, talking about upstart companies, I think it's, I think I'm obligated to talk about failure, the risks of failure. Uh, go Google this and you're gonna find pretty much everywhere, 75% of all companies fail within the first 10 years. Pretty obvious, right? As an investor, I'm gonna argue that it's much, much higher. Um, it's much higher for two reasons. First off, lifestyle businesses. The grind is too much, I'm making enough money, that's it, I'm just gonna stay right here. Investor nightmare. Second one is the dreaded, what I call the acquire hire. The grind's too much, I'm an expert in my industry, I know how to solve a solution, and big company XYZ comes and says, hey, here's a signing bonus, we'll buy your company. That, I, I'm happy when we, we get our money back on those things. Um, funding environment is tough right now. You, you guys are starting a company in a tough time. Availability of capital is constrained. Um, there is, Michael talked a little about a little bit about this. There is some, there is a, I call it the in between the coasts phenomena. Valuations are gonna be a little bit lower right now and papering of those, but Michael did a much better job of, of talking about the paper. Paper's gonna be slightly different in Texas versus the, versus Silicon Valley or versus New York City or wherever. Um, I don't need to talk to you about technological advances. It's happening faster and faster. And so you have, you have picked a time, a, a challenging fundraising time in, in a, in a, in a, area that is just doing nothing but accelerating super fast. I don't need to tell you about that. Um, and then to top it off, it gets better. You get to do this in a super fluid legal and regulatory environment. Navigating all these complexities is, is, is hard. It's a, it's, and it's a big challenge for startups. I'm gonna let that first point sink in a little bit. I thought it was really, really important to add. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some obvious and non-obvious sort of lessons that I've learned. Um, if, if it were up to my wife, I would have approximately zero employees because anytime I would come home and tell her exactly what happened at the office this day, she's like, you got fired. So I've had, I learned how to mitigate that, but, but, but why this is important is you have to have someone who's on your team 100%, who always has your back. And the, the obvious piece of advice here, and, and you're gonna hear it and hear it and hear it is, surround yourself with team members, advisors, mentors, investors that, that have complementary skill sets. And that's super important. It's kind of obvious. Um, my mom gave me this piece of advice. Here's a non-obvious, well, obvious, non-obvious, simple. Stay away from bad people. Bad people leads to you go into the courtroom. If I can give you one, another important item to add, Stay out of the courtroom no matter what. Much to, to every extent that you can stay out of the courtroom. Only one person wins in that scenario. Um, do the right thing by your people. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, remember this, no good deed goes unpunished. You're gonna get punished for doing the right team by your team, by doing the right thing by your team. It's unbelievable. And remember the good times. You're gonna beat yourself up over all the mistakes you've made. You're gonna want all those mistakes back. 
but I think you do have to stop and and celebrate those wins when they're there. Take care of yourself physically and mentally. It it is a challenge. You are going through a grind that's not going to stop. And make better mistakes. Just do whatever you can to make better mistakes tomorrow. And and finally, just to conclude, you sort of chose the roller coaster. Um, enjoy it while you're on it. Oh, God. So... I think there's an opportunity for people to uh, to po post questions and for me to see those. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm going to start that by start this with a question. So we've talked a lot about starting companies. I think the wisdom of these very experienced people is that they've all been part of companies exiting in a good way and exiting in not so good a way. And so. For, for, for people who don't have that experience, that don't have that wisdom, uh, to think about the end, let's talk about, the, let's think about the successful ones. If you think about, you know, what would it take to uh, to encourage those successful exits? What are the considerations at the very beginning that you should be thinking about to, to encourage those, that kind of, some kind of successful exit? I think you should go. You want me to go? Okay. I probably have the least useful advice on this just because I personally have actually not done an exit. You guys have been involved. But I, I think from a from a legal standpoint, one of the things that <clears throat> excuse me, we see really derail companies and this really kind of dovetails off of what, what both of these gentlemen said is there are going to be changes um, with respect to the personnel. The people that are there on the first day are not going to be the same people there one, two, and then you know, nine years later when you're looking for that exit. And so at some point, you know, when you're moving into actually forming an, an entity stage, expect that, plan for that, and have those agreements in place ahead of time. I mean, you know, to, to echo on, on Mike's point about staying out of the courtroom, and we all laugh because I'm a lawyer, but he's right in terms of you, we win. It's fantastic. I have a great time in there, but everyone else fails in the courtroom, and, and a lot of the, the battles that we see are you know, partners that started a company together, they developed technology together, and then they got crosswise for good reasons or bad reasons. And if you don't have that kind of plan in place is to address, you know, if somebody wants out before the company is ready to be bought, if somebody's, somebody is done with this, they no longer want to ride the roller coaster, how do we address that? What's the value of their time? If you're having to deal with that real time when they're leaving, that means you're paying lawyers hourly at, the, at that time. Whereas if you've dealt with it beforehand, you can you know, address that situation and continue to move on and continue to kind of follow that, uh, that, that path. And so that didn't 100% answer your question, but from someone who really personally has not gone through that, that's just one piece of advice I would, would kind of give on that. So, go ahead. I was reading the, the question on the prompter, but I didn't. So think about, so, uh, and, and, and Use the mic. So the thought is, think about the exit. We talked a lot about starting companies. So anticipating a successful exit, what is, is, what is something that we should be thinking about, uh, that we should be giving the, your wisdom about to, the consideration at the forming to, to get the good exit? So I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, a, f a couple of experiences that I think um, now I, I really look for this type of opportunities when I'm involved personally on a startup, uh, because at my age I need to I need to think about exit, right? It's not just you know 20 years from now or something like that. But the best opportunities I had, I I, I didn't get to make a lot of money on these opportunities, but it was a very very fulfilling uh, experience in that before we started the company or right when we started, we already had a buyer. Um, we we had a, a and again, because we were already positioned to sell the company as we start, then uh, you know there's only maybe 18 months that you have to build the company. So you're not talking about making a lot of money, but you know you have such a great, great feeling in your tummy <laughs> in that whatever you're doing is is taking you the right path. So one of those, um, uh, I don't know if I should mention the company, but it's a company that makes some amazing cheesecakes uh, based out of California, and they have a lot of restaurants through the nation. 
and they uh, they they needed a, a specific problem to be solved, and um, and we had a very early stage prototype, a prototype that we had been working maybe for twelve hours before we actually presented it, and and they just loved it, and so we went through that process, and uh, they became our first customer, and um, and and then uh, eighteen months later, um, they they bought our company, so that was a great great uh, expectation. So if you can, there are certain investors, uh, usually more like hedge funds, that specialize in a specific industry. So go ahead and do some research and look what are those high profile investors that invest in companies that they eventually uh, take through an M&A. And, and obviously that's how they make a lot of money. So um, if you're in the automotive industry, there are, a, 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 I would say, not a handful, but maybe three or four really strong uh, investment groups out of Houston. If you are into cybersecurity, you know, be, select the, be, be very de deliberate about focusing on the exit side. Um, if, if, um, and you know, you have a lot of resources to do that. Uh, you're well, Aggies, so you know, just ask any any of us, and we can put you in contact with those people. Um, love to help in that capacity. But uh, yeah, uh, as as we say on the on the entrepreneurial side start at the end, right? Know exactly how things, how, how would you like things to develop? And, um, and, and also keep your attorneys informed because uh, if you have the possibility or the, the uh, if, if there's a likelihood for you to sell your company within the first three or four years, definitely uh, get your, your attorneys involved early, early on to make sure that all your paperwork is ready because going through the due diligence process as, as Pete knows, and all of us know, it is one of the most uncomfortable um, stages in, in the in the in the development of a startup. Um, not just from a legal perspective, but just overall, um, everything everything that you've done, good or bad, is going to come up, and uh, and and you have to fix it before you you hand off your company, your baby. So I hope that was yeah, that was good. useful. Yeah. Like the Really, I can only sort of support both of their answers. I This is a hard question for me to answer because I do think a lot about this, but I think about it in terms of a very specific type of business. And I think that the at the at the overriding level, the three things that are important is make sure that I have the legal structure that's there, that I can actually sell it, be super protective of your cap table, and be cognitive of your compensation structure. I don't think any of us talked about compensation and the strategies for compensation of your employees, but it's super important because it has a, the big impact that it really has, or in, in the business that I owned, what it really was, it was, the, one, it was the largest component in order to get us to our EBIT. And many of the, many, many businesses are priced off of your, off your EBIT, and that was a big consideration for us. So you mentioned, hold the mic, I'm going to, you mentioned cap table. And so in our work, we, we, uh, we have lots of conversations with founders about cap table. Uh, there's, there's awareness that that cap table is going to get impacted significantly through investment rounds and adding team. But continue, could you add some more color about the thoughts about uh, reserving some equity so you don't have to create new equity and, you know, uh, you know, again, some of the things that's going to happen and, 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 so, and bring some of that perspective back to what, you know, at the beginning of forming a company. I'm really going to pass it back to Michael again. I, I really do think that it's, I, that is something that we would consult with our lawyer on is like, what, what's the strategy there? Um, how I would look at it as an investor is, is, is I think about it. I, I want to put a little bit more thought into it. That, that's a tough question for me to answer. Michael, if you don't have an answer, I'm going to answer my own question. So go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. No pressure there. Um, I mean, I think we kind of talked about it a little bit during the presentation. I, I think it goes back to you know, be forward thinking, are you looking 18 months down the line? Or are you looking multiple years down the line and recognize that their your your cap table is going to get messier, for lack of a better term, and, and make sure that you have suffi sufficient capitalization up front that you can account for those contingencies. I mean, there's on some level. You, you can't have 
too much capitalization other than the the filing fees in Delaware and other places can go up. And so there, that is a consequence if you have, have too much. But it, it ultimately, it's better to have some more capitalization you think you'll ever use because you'll, you'll oftentimes you'll end up needing that. Then let's hear what the real answer is. Well, no, no, no. So, so um, we know, you know, you form a company, there's a cap table. Uh, you have key personnel. You know you're going to add future key personnel. Uh, and you, you don't want to have to dilute everybody in the, in the company every time you do something like that. And so you would think about, uh, and so this goes back to some of these details. Uh, you form a C-Corp. Uh, all the equity is going to be initially common stock. And then you're going to create your option pool. And that's going to be a different class. And then the first cash investor is going to come in. That's going to be preferred stock that is going to do some abusive things to the common and hopefully not touch the option pool so much. And so as you're managing a company in the beginning, uh, I've seen it. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to form a, uh, uh, I form my company. I'm going to make a 25% option pool. I'm going to just, I've got myself and two other founders. Like I'm going to d d distribute 20% uh, of that 25%. Well, next thing you know, you've only got 5% left to hire all the rest of the team that you want to bring in. Well, I got to, you know, so I can't squeeze them all into that 5%, so I'm going to add some more. Well, that means all, somebody's getting diluted. At every step along the way, that pie needs to add up to 100%. It'd be a beautiful thing if you at some point could have a pie that's got 120% in it, but it, that's not possible. So I think those are some of the things that that we think about as advising as advising people is, Yes, that first cap table is important, of course, but the amount of common stock you might have versus options versus what's going to happen in preferred uh, shares that are going to come in in, you know, again, varying depending on the kind of company, you know, a, a few rounds of investment. Be thinking about where you're going to end up in that as a, you know, and, and how you can do things to protect, you know, create value and therefore protect value through those stages, uh, and, and the the beginning has has influence on that. But what happens along the way is 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 actually more important. So, um, and so again, in in not allocating all of your equity in the beginning leaves you room to add people, add uh, other stakeholders without having to dilute everybody. Just a thought. Anyway, yes, sir. And just for the benefit of, of folks that might still be online, so, and I don't know if we have the ability to pass any microphone mm -hmm. around so that we, that I don't have to repeat this every time we do this, uh, is, uh, is there any licensing with the SEC related to uh, selling equity in a C-Corp? That you are. That you are. Um, let me give you the lawyer's favorite answer here. It depends. Um, and, and in all seriousness, though, it, it depends. Typically, yes. You know, I'll admit I am not a securities expert. We have those on staff. I'm not one. But my understanding is that when you're particularly when you're coming with uh, C corps, and particularly if it is a public company, that is always a sure, security probably. transaction right. there. If you're dealing with a private entity, it is generally going to be a transaction involving securities, in which case do you have to necessarily report it? I don't think so at all times, but again, caveat of this is not my area of expertise, but it's one of those that when you're potentially either offering, dealing, or trading, or selling securities, you absolutely want to make sure that you're doing so in the, in the proper manner. And so that's, I would definitely recommend um, checking with someone on that. So sorry, I don't have a direct answer, but it it it's something, it's good that you're asking that question because it's something to be very aware of. And I would just add that it really depends also on the amount of money that you're selling. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you develop a very simple instrument like a debenture or a convertible note, um, and you keep your total offering at less than a million dollars, that that has changed recently. I just don't know exactly the new limit. But uh, in in our case at our incubator, we try to only engage in fundraising support if it's not more than one million dollar in one year, uh, and usually. Uh, for, for the startups that we have, again, our average is 450, 450K, so that's pretty, you know, it's very safe. However, uh, to Pete's point, what we try to do is look at 
how much is going to be needed for by the startup and only compromise about 10 to 15 percent of equity uh, for the for the first and second small rounds, not Series A, but just kind of seed rounds. And if you're part of the company, it's pretty straightforward. And usually, it's, it's nice to register. Uh, it, it's a, it's not a really a, a legal expense per se, but that way, your your startup uh, uh, shows up on um, all these other different comp um, websites like um, uh, Pitch Deck and, and and those those entities. That way, other investors. If you are if you are seeking investment from more sophisticated investors, they can go back and check. Oh, they did this, they did that, and it's all registered. So it helps from that perspective, and it's, again, it's not expensive. There was a question that was on the screen. Now it's not on the screen, but I'm going to ask the question anyway because I liked it. So uh, it was related to therapeutics. But I'm going to generalize it. So how much money should you raise? You know, and you talked about raising. As much as you can, but that there's actually, and then we also had some discussion about spending the money you have. And you know, every time you raise money, the thought is you're going to increase the value of of your company, so future money would be cheaper to to raise. So, any thoughts about how you think about identifying the amount of money you raise at at a given time, and 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 sort of, and and, and obviously. It depends, but is any other any other thoughts about that? Uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, so, it, but it really does, um, and, and we look at it on a case by case by case basis. And every company is going to be a little bit different. But sort of the overriding, the overriding advice that we give typically in that situation: if someone wants to give you money at the terms that you're willing to sell, don't be afraid to oversubscribe. Um, you, you, you've, we've built this number together that you're raising. You know how much it's going to cost to execute the plan in that in that time period to whatever that milestone is. Take roughly that, whatever that is. You know, I, I will add. Uh, thank you. That's that's really useful. Um, what we try to do is see how much money you're going to need to get to Series A, and then work that backwards. Um, Usually, uh, if you're if you're building a medical device, for instance, depending on on the level of of work needed to get FDA compliance or FDA approval, uh, it can be very very expensive. So you, you you those are kind of the exceptions, but there are very good investors that specialize and invest only on those type of deals. So um, they are going to be be able to help you kind of structure the deal. It's, it's great when an investor is helping you, you know, come up with the numbers, right? Um, especially when it's a, a, a professional investment entity. Uh, for for us in our incubator, we have a lot of software companies. Uh, the, the ones that deal with robotics are going to be simpler. We have a nano nano satellite technology, uh, another startup that does uh, drones. So we're not talking about a lot of uh, funding needed to get to um, to a, to an MVP. Um, so it's easier for us to to kind of work from there again. In our case, um, you know, if, if you have uh, the capability to raise a million dollars, even if you only need half a million, you know, uh, authorize the whole million and raise as much. You know, it's like after 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 a certain stage, it's just like printing money, right? You just continue to to pull from your pre-allocated amount of equity that you designated for your convertible notes. The reason I love convertible notes is because usually only 50% of the of the investors are going to convert into equity. Uh, the other 50% take their money out with interest, which is great because at that point your company should be valued at a more, more higher uh, level. Yeah, so that and what what Jose just said there is, is a really Im important insight into goes back to the point about thinking about how your company gets diluted and how you structure investments along the way and the amount of you know, your company sells for $100 million. How many of those $100 million goes into your pocket versus everybody else? Structuring convertible notes versus preferred investment. I mean, some of those things can have incredible impact on the amount of money that goes back to the founding invent, you know, the founding, uh, the founders of the company, much more than whether you started with 50% or 25%. Uh, something to be thoughtful of. Um, all right, this looks like it's just moved on me. Uh, so there was a question on here. 
uh, about case studies. And so I don't know if there's an, you know, and we've, we've, we've talked about a few examples. I don't know if there's in the course of this conversation, if there's any of you have had any other examples that have, that have come to mind that would illustrate a point that Jose looks like you have something to go. Well, I think that it's a case studies about, um, uh, let me see that the first one. No, the case study about research based company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's right now the first one. So, um, as, as a matter of coincidence, uh, my first company was a research and development company. So I, I guess I can just talk to that. Uh, uh, the company, I, I formed the company in 1986. And then um, we, we started really mostly doing uh, engineering and science and engineering software projects. Then we started doing, um, doing technology development beyond software. So a little bit of robotics back in the early days. Uh, by 2001, right, uh, August 2001, right before uh, September 11th, I, I sold the company. And, um, and, and it went, it, it, it wasn't a huge sellout because if you think about it, uh, the way the companies get valued through uh, either total revenue or earnings, um, you know, when you have a, an R&D company, when you, turn light, when you turn the lights off at your lab, you stop making money, right? So uh, just to address that specific research-based company uh, question, uh, you know, it was a great journey, uh, but I will not do that again. <laughs> just based on what I've seen, uh, on based on, on intellectual property, product, um, licensing options, those type of things. It's a lot of work. It was, again, fantastic. And it, it taught me how to, how to uh, be a, a good engineer and a good product developer. But... Um, the, the people that we develop products for, they are the ones that made the money. I love case studies, uh, but I and I can't actually answer the question as asked and as it as it speaks to that specific type of company. But case studies are super important to me. I think of case studies more as a marketing tool, a way to demonstrate to show someone how you solve their problem. I know that's not the answer to the question that they're asking, but I thought it was relevant to mention that good drip strategy. Do you want to say that? So I'm going to answer this bottom question quickly, which is, does uh, Texas A&M assist young firms uh, that license technology in meeting relevant investor community? So yes. Uh, our Texas A&M Innovation Office are your partners in this entire journey. And uh, the exact uh, needs of each company goes back to it depends because I often equate uh, uh, starting and growing a company like giving birth and raising a child. I have two boys, same mother, same father, but they have very different needs. Uh, and if I were to, to apply a one size fits all to, you know, and so, and, and so that's in the same way we uh, identify, you know, work with, with inventors and founders and investors and entrepreneurs and, uh, and on a case by case basis, uh, find the best combination to make the strongest companies. Um, we're, we're coming up on time, so we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. Uh, Mike, I don't know, Michael, I don't know if you have a response to this question uh, about what type of entity should be formed to fund a nonprofit organization, which is not exactly what we do, but it's, um, it's a question. So. It is. I mean, so, again, it depends on exactly what you want to do, and I realize we're kind of joking about that, but it is true in the, in the sense of, you know, the nonprofit designation is primarily based on uh, tax status and then also what you're going to do with whatever money you've taken in in terms of nonprofit means you're not going to keep a bunch of it so you can go buy boats and things like that uh, although some do and, and so the typical entity is again going to be a corporation for that but it, it you know nonprofit corporation is going to be probably the most common one that we see and the most common one that we form but it really is going to depend in terms of you know, what what is your actual uh, intention behind a nonprofit? Some people 
are intending to do a more traditional nonprofit, i.e. a charity. Others have kind of a, a different idea in terms of they're going to be using this as a, as a, a mechanism to, to encourage other types of investment through someone else and, and whatnot. And so I, you know, I realize that's not a direct answer per se, but it really, it, unfortunately, it really does come down to what are you trying to do? I mean, is it, are you trying to create a, a, a shelter for, for dogs and cats? Well, that may be one mechanism versus are you trying to uh, run 30 baseball teams like MLB does? So that's a nonprofit technically, you know, different, different, different people. So, um, but happy to discuss that with whoever asked that question. Just wanted to comment really fast. Um, so every year we accept two nonprofits um, into the incubator because uh, it's very hard to to use conventional funding and so on, and we don't take equity on nonprofits, obviously. So most of the ones we take are, are going to be 501 C3s, um, and um, there are some political nonprofits that you can get into. But I'm assuming this is going to be more like a social program. So um, I wanted to mention that. There are now tools and methods that you can use to enter into social entrepreneurship. So still do good, but do it under a, a for-profit uh, standard, C Corp or LSE, um, where you are able to to designate funds uh, that you generate for uh, good causes. And if um, there, there is a really good program at the Bush School that deals with uh, nonprofits and philanthropy, and and they are a great resource. Um, so again, depending uh, on on the type of uh, the mission of the nonprofit, will be a, will be good to know, so we can provide better advice. So, uh, so could, could you hear? So, under a common good model, do you have to exclude certain funding sources for buy-in? Did I get that right? You mean to sell equity? No. You know, I I don't want to lie to you. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. But um, but I would love to talk to you about that because we already have a couple of entities that come to us. Uh, with that, so as we do the research, I'll be happy to to relay the information to you. So, okay. It will, I apologize. I'm going to ask one more question, uh, and I don't know who wants to jump in, but it's this last question on the screen, and it goes back to the idea of valuation. Uh, you mentioned convertible notes, safes, the idea of priced investments versus future priced investments, and and the implications of those. So, would anybody like to just speak a little bit about? Remember, my perspective is always early stage. So angel round, pre-seed, seed, pre-series A typically right now, or seed plus, whatever you want to call it. But um, it, to us, when, when asked that question by founders um, at the stage that we typically invest in, we recommend a safe or a convertible note. Prim and, and primarily um, due to expense, it, a, a price round is super expensive. Uh, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Else? Yeah, I would say 90% uh, of the, the startup uh, members use a convertible note or a safe note. And um, it's based, I, I'm sure all of you know, but it, it's based on, on the performance that you're able to achieve and where you're going to be in two, three, or four years, depending on how you structure it. So um, that's the advantage, right? That first, the holder of the note, uh, if, if things don't go well, they will get their money before the um, equity members, right? The members of the company, the, the owners of the company. And, uh, and but get the money also after um, the banks get their money. So they're kind of right there in the middle. And, um, and as long as you have a good discount that you offer, it becomes pretty attractive. Usually the, uh, the, the discounts we've seen are about 20% around there. Um, meaning that by the time, if I invest in your company, if I give you a loan, I'm gonna be receiving interest. By the time I convert into equity, you're going to give me 20% discount of whatever the investors at that time are going to, are going to evaluate your company. At. And um, also, usually we recommend that you put a cap. That way, if you are super successful, the cap 
uh, gives or affords the opportunity to the investor to make a lot of money. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, you, maybe you were projecting to be at a, at a $50 million valuation in, in three years, but you actually ended up at $300 million. Well, if you put a cap at 100, I st I'm going to I'm going to triplicate my money in addition to getting my great deal, right? So, just some points to ponder.